computer. Yes. Oh, it's even told me I'm recording in progress. Pity, pity, pity. Last month, I forgot to stop the recording. I was in turmoil. So did this thing just enter the unknown? But Darcy saved me. So we have been recording uh, these videos. And it's been very popular because a lot of folks, as usual, can't attend uh, in, in virtually person. And so the recordings have, have been handy. I think um, this is this is the last kind of technical uh, video of this of the season. And then in November, I'm trying to rig up how we're going to do a Zoom final exam. So I, I pretty much uh, have it in my mind how we're going to do the the final exam, which is always just a kind of a review of, of the year and, and all the different things we do and, and whatnot. But uh, we'll have some fun with that. And uh, I think next year I will do one live day and, and continue to do the Zooms and record them just so we have, uh, I kind of want to be like Ira Flato or something and have you know, 64,000 episodes by the time I, I, I leave my tenure at SPAT, which is in another 15 or 20 years. So I, I have a lot of episodes to catch up uh, with Ira. So anyway, and I see we have, we're on time and we have some people here. So uh, basically winter is coming. Is, is there, are there Game of Thrones people out there? I don't know why. I actually watched all of Game of Thrones, but uh, winter is coming takes on a whole new meaning. Uh, for, for us, winter is coming for oysters. I, uh, you could chime in and unmute if I, if I asked a general question and you wanted to chime in. Did uh, this year I noticed in larger oysters and in seed, uh, much more mortality than I have in many years. Uh, and a lot of times with oysters that are showing mortality of larger oysters that you were kind of getting ready to eat and you put a hundred in a, a, a box or a, a, a cage or a net and you go to harvest them uh, the next week and 10 of them are dead. What's that all about? And they were perfect. And you just did them a week ago and you go to harvest them and 10 of them are dead. And then you take 50 out and you whatever, and you go back two weeks later and five more are dead. What, what's going on there? Uh, a lot of times, and, and it doesn't look like there were any crabs and the cages are nice and clean. The oysters look great. Uh, that's kind of what you would possibly be seeing if there was dermo pressure. And dermo is an oyster disease, uh, uh, Perkensis marinus, and it's a, it's, a, it's a protozoan parasite. And it's pretty much in our oysters. Uh, it's not like uh, we've never had it or heard of it before, but mortality in oysters, in, in older oysters, uh, and older being that they have just overwintered one or two winters. They don't have to be five years old or seven years old. That you'll see like 10% die off incrementally following warm winters. You see that more than you normally do. So for all that, uh, I suppose most humans, except for those hardy humans that love to go ice pick mountain climbing, uh, alpine skiing, uh, glacier hopping, uh, and basic tundra exploration a, a la Shackleton, which I'm not into at all. I am the least winter person I know. All I do is sit around the wood stove and burn wood all winter long. That's, that's, my, that's my sport is, is cutting wood. Uh, some people love winter. Oysters love a cold winter. They really do like a cold winter. They, they're, they're rigged for the cold. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to worry 
as much about cold winters as you do warm winters. I'll never forget uh, talking to Dave Brelier at Frank and Flower and Son. I made the mistake of saying, oh, wasn't that a great winter? It was so nice and warm. And he, and he looked at me like I had four heads because basically he knew that mortality was going to be higher that year because of the warm winter. So that that's uh, one of the reasons why in the Chesapeake, Dermo uh, is a real problem because you never get a cold winter to kind of knock that that uh, pressure back. So if folks saw that, uh, it could have been that. Um, that's the only thing I can really uh, make heads or tails of with the conspicuous higher mortality. The only other thing that could have been happening, but I don't really recall any big bloom of cochlidinium, which is the mahogany type. It is a red algae, uh, but it's uh, it, it, it's not the toxic red algae that you see uh, with with you know certain algal species that that really cause uh, a, a problem with uh, mortality, not mortality of oysters. Uh, oysters can eat, uh, for instance, Alexandrium is a red tide algae that has a neurotoxin in it. And uh, it, the oysters can eat it just fine. But if the, uh, Look and see what's going on here. I've got Chris on my screen, but he's not there. Hey, Chris. Uh, and he locked out my own thing. Okay. I guess that's okay. So oysters can eat the red tide. There's Chris. Oysters can eat the red tide. It's got a neurotoxin. If humans eat the oyster, they can get sick. In mahogany tide, this cochlidinium, uh, you can eat the oysters that have been in that red tide. And, and again, we, we kind of call it, um, we call it mahogany tide just to dis, uh, kind of decipher it from the toxic red algae. So we call it a mahogany tide. The oysters don't like it very much. And it's a, it's a really weird algae because it moves, it looks like an oil slick. If, that, if there are any yachters or boaters out there that were out this year uh, or any year that the cochlidinium is, is in the water, you can sail or motor into it. And it almost looks like it's a cloud that's blocking the sun as you see this kind of dark spot in the water, but it's the algae and it really moves almost like an, like a, uh, an oil slick. Hey, Andrew, you know, I cleaned your uh, lunch box up at the dock the other day. They looked really sad. So I have other oysters for you, but I did see your tags and I, I, I thought, hey, there's, there's Andrew's oysters. Uh, I haven't seen Andrew I, in ages. I plan to be uh, an active participant next season. I just, oh, good, with COVID, good. everything I got, no I'm worries. Just looking forward to coming up. You know, no worries about uh Obviously, with all this stuff that's been going on, everybody gets a pass, and and we're going to thank be, you, Kim. No, no worries. I mean, we're going to. Right. I'll say one last thing, so I don't interrupt. I, I miss you, Kim. I can't wait to see you. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll we'll all get together. All right, great. Yeah, we'll have a big big party at my new place and have a big extra spat party. So uh, anyway, um, so those are some things that could be causing mortality, but I will tell you that cold and winters is not going to be something you have to worry about for mortality, unless, of course, one of two things happens. Your oysters go ashore, like they broke off the line and they're up on the banks and they sit there all winter long and, and get like a, a a deep freeze. Uh, oysters have a built-in antifreeze glycoprotein. They can almost freeze solid. And what happens with that uh, glycoprotein is that it keeps ice crystals from forming inside the oyster around a couple key spots like the kidney, the heart. And so they're kind of like in suspended animation. I've pulled oysters out of the water in December and opened them up 
and they were like oyster sickles. I mean, they were really, they had, they, they were crunchy, like eating a, a frozen a popsicle oyster. And, uh, but, but if you took those oysters and put them in a, 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 a little tin of tepid salt water or even fresh water, they'll thaw out right away and they're perfectly fine. So, you know, when you're saving oysters, you can't save them in the freezer and have them be alive after, you know, after a week in the freezer, they're definitely not going to thaw out from that. Uh, and, and so if you take that analogy of the freezer, you don't want your oysters being embedded in ice where they're going to go into a deep freeze because that's going to kill them. Okay. Now, if the water is frozen on the surface, but the, the oysters are underneath it and they're just in the water and, and not in the ice, they're going to do just fine. If they're exposed out of the water in an ice flow, but are covered by water every tidal cycle, then they're not going to freeze either. However, and Darcy had a great, she asked me if I had any winter pictures and I had lost all of them on my last computer switch that happened at Cornell. I never got my old files back. And I had some great pictures of, you know, eight inches of ice on top of all this oyster gear. The oysters could care less. The gear was getting crushed. And if ice locks onto anything and decides to move, it can rip apart anything. It can move VWs out to sea if it latches onto it. Uh, that's why in places like uh, Wellfleet, in Wellfleet, they take all the oysters off of their oyster grounds and they put them in literally in walk-in containers that are temperature controlled so that they don't freeze. They're not freezers. They're maintaining them at 38 or 40 degrees. And they take them out in, uh, I guess, about December and put them back in, in, in at the end of March. So they're out for months with no water, just out of the water. And the reason why they do that is the uh, the, the flats are so shallow and the ice can get so thick that the ice will just scour all the oysters away. It will just take everything away. Uh, and so they just literally, I've seen up in Cape Cod, you drive by and there's a truck going by just loaded like Beverly Hillbillies to the, just all over the place. And they're off, you know, to their container to, to palletize all their bags of oysters. And that's how they do it. They, they kind of have them in, in our regular Vexar bags and they, uh, and, and they crate them up in, in, in these things and hold them there. They used to dig holes and throw tarps over them and do it. Now they've gotten a little bit more, uh, more calculated about it. But um, so, you, you know, as we've been doing this for years and years and winterizing, uh, oh, and I forgot, gosh, I forgot to, uh, there's a flyer that we have on the website and it's, it's tips of overwintering tips. It's on our website. It's, it's uh, a, like a checklist of winter things to do. Uh, I was going to print it up so I could read off of it, but it's available and I'll probably uh, remember all the things I wanted to say about them. But basically, one of the first things that's on that list is, you know, kind of prepare for the worst. And if you prepare for the worst and it never happens, then it never happened. Uh, and I say that because, you know, this hasn't happened in a while, but I used to, there was a, an oyster grower who we had kind of set up and, and he was a commercial grower and we we're helping him out a lot. And every year, he would come to me and say, well, I just got my ice buoys out on my gear. And an ice buoy is a special buoy that kind of keeps ice from forming and it breaks up the ice and it, it, it's a real pain to rig up. And, and one year he said, you know what? I'm not going to do these ice buoys. We don't have any ice. And that year the ice came in 
locked into his regular buoys and all of his gear went from hog, hog neck in, in, in Southold out to Gardner's Bay. Uh, it was gone and people were finding his cages literally in Gardner's Bay years later. So, you, you know, if, if you get tired of, of trying to winterize your stuff, if you're a commercial guy, I can totally relate to that because it's a lot of labor. And if nothing ever happens, okay. Uh, oh, Darcy said something, I missed it. Uh, it, it, it here's the wintering documents. Uh, Okay, so it's there and, and it's on the chat thing and, and it, is, it is available uh, also on our, on our website and, and I can, we can send it out in an addendum email. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a straightforward document. First thing is gonna say, prepare, prepare for the worst. And uh, it's in the email I sent out today. See, you know, Darcy never fails to, to, to take care of all my uh, inefficient, uh, meandering about my brain is working overtime my body and my and and, and my uh, memory are are in in the ups truck that just drove away so uh that would be the first thing the second thing is again oysters don't care about the cold and humans do so do this stuff before the glacier potential glacier sets in they're saying it's going to be a colder winter. You know, who knows about any of this stuff? But if you if you decide to put everything off until the end of December, especially at the Marine Center, you're going to get very little help uh, because nobody wants to go and out, out when it's really cold to overwinter oysters. You should be able to get a break from, you know, December to March. You, you, you don't really need to ever tend your oysters. It's a nice break for everybody. You can go off to Belize or you can, you can you know, do whatever you want to do. You can do like I am and just sit around the wood stove and burn, burn wood and, and watch the flames and, and wait for it. And that's actually not true, by the way. Our busiest time at the Marine Center is really uh, January, February, and, and March, because that's the hatchery season. So, you know, we're, we're actually gearing up. Uh, we have a, quite a crew at the Marine Center and we're year round, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The, uh, the, the crew spawn scallops on Wednesday. We condition scallops for the fall spawn and they got a spawn. I don't know how big of a spawn, it was a, more of a experiment, but you know, we love to experiment and we, we're going to be branching out. So don't feel like, Oh, I, he just said that we don't do anything from, from December to March and we can all go away. Well, you can, but I'm not going away and the group isn't going away. We're actually very busy in the wintertime. Uh, and you can be involved in that. You can learn the hatchery processes and the algae process and all that. But you're not going to be getting out your waders, Chris. Oh, well, maybe Chris will. He's pretty hardy and he's got these really thick waders. So if he wants to crack, I mean, I've cracked through the ice and, and done stuff, but, uh, you know, we're going to go through that, how you can have your oysters for the season uh, without messing with too much of it. Uh, but what I've found is that we, we, we can simplify things quite a, quite a bit. This is not a big... Uh, a, a big deal to overwinter your stock, seeing as we're, we're little oyster gardeners and not a commercial operation. Uh, and so I've got props here. So uh, you're gonna do, you're gonna prepare for the worst. Now, uh, look, there's, there's three or four different kinds of spat growers. There's spat growers that grow at the Marine Center. There's spat growers that grow at the Tiana uh, uh, site, which has quite a number of growers, 80 plus growers at Tiana. There are people at their own docks. And then there's a couple other little things going on like the Sac Harbor group and whatnot. So what happens at the Marine Center is that pretty much everybody is floating their cages with the, uh, with the cages and the, and the black floats. And for years, 
people have been getting ready for the winter, I'm going to say 25% of the people do something different for the winter and the other 75% don't do anything. And it, it doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difference. So I'm going to show you for, for the Marine Center, the simplest way of doing things. Now, Tiana is a little trickier because they pull the docks. And so we move everything from Tiana over to Southold. And I've, had, I've been having a winterizing process for Tiana. And I'm modifying that a little bit this year, too. So I'm going to show everybody that. Where'd you go, Sunday? I saw you run away. OK. Uh, and then for your own docks, I've, that's probably been the hardest one to collectively get everybody on board because people do all kinds of things differently. And inadvertently, I get one or two people or three or four, sometimes more, that lose everything during the winter. Okay. And that's what we're, that's what we're totally trying to avoid. Uh, and so we're going to go through all of those. Now, the, for, for folks that have their, it's a good thing my wife is in here and she, I have all my props. You know what I had to do? I had to pressure wash all my props to bring them into the house. Because <laughs> Normally I would do it at the Marine Center in the classroom. And when I left, the classroom was trashed. There's like all this weird, you know, algae, dried algae all over the floor. So I actually pressure washed all the gear. So here's your cage. Hey there. Uh, okay, so he, there's Tom. I, I got a big view of Tom there. I, I don't know. So here's your cage. And a lot of people have their floats right on the side. Now, listen, we have a we have a change in the way we do things lately. We have all these pressure washers all over the place. And people have been keeping their gear really, really clean. Now, it took me until maybe just a couple months ago to, for it to dawn on me. And we have a pressure washer at Tiana. People have been keeping things nice and clean. It, it, it took me the longest time to dawn on me that the reason why you put your floats on the side is so you can flip your cages, okay? The fouling gets on the bottom. Usually the sun's faking the top. You can go out there and you can flip them and now the fouling's on the top and you can scrub it and whatnot and blah, blah, blah. Well, the simple fact is if you're keeping your gear clean all the time, there's no reason to have your floats on the side. You can always have them on the top. And quite simply, if you always had your floats on the top, what would you have to do to overwinter? Well, very little to practically nothing. And I'm not going to say nothing because there are some things since we're not going to be looking at our oysters for a couple of months, there are some things that we're going to do on the day that you're winterizing. Even if you have your floats on the top, there's still things that you're going to do. But for the most part, that's, that's pretty much all you have to do to winterize your oysters, is put your floats on the top. The reason being that if ice comes into the creek, it, it's, it's, it would lock into the floats and go up and down and the oysters would still be beneath it. And there's a couple of modifications. I mean, I have seen it at, at, uh, at Cornell, eight inches of ice in that creek. So, you know, we haven't seen that in a little while and we haven't really seen any winter mortality because of cold. Hello, you snuck in the back. You didn't have to sneak in the back. Now she's gonna see all my props that I pressure washed in the living room. Okay. That's the other Kim. If you didn't know, it's Kim and Kim here. There's Kim. There's that. There's Kimmy coming in from school. Okay, so that would be the simplest way. Now, uh, there's a trick, by the way. Oh, and hi, Kimmy. Hi there. Oh, look at there. There's Mary. I haven't seen Mary in ages. Okay, so here is a fine mesh cage, and here's a coarser mesh cage. Now. You know, you can leave, you can leave your uh, 
oysters, if you're keeping your fine, finer mesh cage clean, you can grow market oysters in this stuff, in this thing. It's, it's only when uh, they get really fouled and you don't get flow that you're going to start compromising your oysters. So, but feel free to switch them out to a coarser mesh at any time. Uh, we have plenty of gear to do that with. Uh, just a, uh, where's my uh, little collection of table ties here. Here's a little trick. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. If you're, if you're using these floats, as you must already know, you need a 14 inch table tie. It's gotta be 14 inch. And if you're gonna put them on the top, it's, it's also, that's the other thing about having them on the side. They're very easy to rig up and the top's a little trickier, but if you put a, if you put a pre-bend in there, uh, where's my camera? You put a pre-bend in there and really bend it, you know, and give it a nice bend. Let me see that. So when you go to do this, here's the page, you can, you, you can just slip it in. And if it's got a nice bend, which this one, I'm really gonna put a bend on it. Like now that I think of it, I'm going to, you see this, it's almost like a, a right angle now. So when I go in here, uh, it, it, it pops right up from the mesh. See that, but I got I got it there, and so now I can now I can lock it right on to the top, and there it was on the top. So I should have had one of these pre. I, I hate boring people and all this, so I'm going to have to tell a joke or something. Okay. okay. <laughs> now I know, I know, I know. You get enough <laughs> out of this thing. So here's the zip tie. I'm putting a quick 45 degree on it. Give it a little extra twist pre-bend. It goes up through the hole. Uh, you can't see what I'm doing. That, this is the one thing I haven't not figured out about Zoom is how to do, you know, PowerPoints are one thing because everyone's looking at the PowerPoint. But when you're when you're doing props, I mean, I can't stand up. I can do, I'm trying to do stand up, a different kind of stand up. Uh, I can't stand up and do this. So there, oh, there we're boring people. I can hear people are starting to, and we put that on the top. Now, what I want to show you. Just lift it up a little so we could see where you're yes. putting those twist okay, ties. So, so now we have it on the top. And we got, I didn't do it, you know, if I were doing this carefully, uh, where's my other flip? If I was doing this carefully, it doesn't really matter. We're, did, we're gonna do two floats. Now you wanna do two floats like that, and they can be straight. I, didn't, I, I wasn't paying attention because I was worried about boring everybody. So this one is all crooked. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. But the reason why you need two is you don't want your cage to do this. Here's the float. You know, that's another problem with people that are winterizing oysters and not getting out to them. If you're using an inferior cable tie and one of your floats comes off the side, what's it going to do? It's going to go like that with the side that has the float. Now all your oysters are down in the bottom and that's not good. You want to keep them nice and horizontal. So Let's pretend we put two floats on, so I won't bore anybody anymore. Now, here's a couple things. Here's a couple uh, options for people, including at Tyen, uh, and most, maybe even more importantly, folks at Tyen. Folks at Tyen and at the Marine Center have multiple cages floating on their line. Now, at the Marine Center, you don't have to move anything. You just have to get everything nice and clean. And we're going to talk about a couple of things you can do with your oysters as you're leaving for, for your trip to, to the Himalayas or wherever you're going for the winter or, or just to the grocery store and, and, and going in your house in Southfold. That's fine too. Uh, at Tiana, if you have multiple cages, 
What we've been doing in the past is taking them out of these cages and putting them in lantern nets, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But I've started to have folks overwinter at Tayana in their, in their existing gear, because I figured that it's just as easy to make bridles of these, and we're going to make a bridle of these, uh, to make a bridle of these and those I can store just about as easily as, as lantern nets. The reason why I haven't in the past is it's really hard to move everybody out of Tyana and get it to fit at the Marine Center on the lines I have. But at this point, uh, I've noticed that people are winterizing so many nets that I'm going to have 400 nets coming out of Tyana and all of a sudden it's pretty daunting. So here's the thought of bridle. I've got, if anyone needs equipment for overwintering any of this stuff, if you need rope, if you need zip ties, if you need more floats, if you need lantern nets, uh, there's a couple other things. We've got all of that. So, so just come along by. I, I, uh, I'm going to be cutting a whole bunch of two fathom pot warp. Everyone knows how many feet are in a fathom. Of course you do. You're all, you're all bay people. All right. A fathom is one, is, is supposed to be six feet, but I use an arm length. So my fathoms are five foot seven and a half. Is that Michael in the background? Yeah. Okay. So here's two pieces of pot warp. And what I can do now is if I, have a, if I have two cages and I want to really, let's say I'm at Tyana and I have two cages. This doesn't work for bay boxes, by the way, Michael. This only works for these things. Okay. If I have two cages, what I can do is I can take one of these lines and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a line and I'm going to pass it through the mesh. I'm going to have to turn some lights on in here in a minute and maybe even get some reading glasses. I passed it through the mesh. There it is. Now I'm going to pass it through the mesh on the other side of the page, about equal. And we can do this. You know, I'm just showing you in general, but feel free to come by. We'll give everybody a hand. So now that I've done that, I take my two ends and I even them up. I know some folks have seen me do this a million times. Now they're even on both sides, and I and I do a round turn. It's just through, around, and through. I don't think anybody can not tie this knot. That's that. that it, it's not. It, it, it's not even a knot. No, it's a knot. It's a. It's just a kind of a stopper knot. So what I just did here is I just locked this piece of line in place. It can't move anymore. What are you drinking there? What was that? <laughs> yeah. Using the bottle. Can I oh. ask a question while I have your attention? Anytime. Yeah, try and write in anything. Okay. So if we're gonna tie them, leave them up at Tiana, where off of what? No, no, no. They're all coming to the Marine Center. Oh, they are. Oh, I thought you were no, saying no, that, that wasn't the issue. It's just that instead of here's what we used to do at Tiana. We dump all your oysters out, we put them in lantern nets. This is a lantern net. Then you know we take two lantern nets, we tie them together, and now they're like saddlebags, and I throw them over the buoy line, and I winterize them. And there's a couple other things you need to do with that. You. you can still do that. That's fine. Uh, because we have so many new people that don't have multiple, multiple generations of oysters, they can uh, simplify the overwintering process by just bridling up their cages that they're growing. And by the way, I don't know what happened to Tiana this year, but I've never seen such tremendous growth in oysters this year. I mean, the, all the newcomers will be eating their own oysters this Thanksgiving. It's really amazing. I've never seen such beautiful oysters. Uh, so that was the lantern that we're going to come back to that in a minute. So to continue this bridle, uh, the thing about the bridle 
it for me the most important thing is it's going to save space but it also does something else it 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 does it, it does a number of different things one thing that it does is it preserves your floats that you bought <laughs> okay and, and i mean if you if you if you have me winterize them, which means you abandon your oysters to have me do it, which happens every year. I know that sounds callous, but it happens every year that people don't come and winterize their oysters, and I do it for them. And and then you know your cages. Where are your cages? This way you preserve all your gear. Uh, that's one thing. But you also are doing an interesting experiment of how well your oysters do that are hanging down lower. Because here's what I have here. I can stand up, hold on. Let me get my camera up here. Okay. So here's, it's just two lines woven through, and now it's a bridle. It's got four stopper knots, it's locked in place, stopper stopper on both sides now one trick i always do is i take my hand as a measuring device four fingers and tie another knot and, and when i'm tying a knot look i'm just taking this i'm going around and through it's not it's it's, it's not a, a complex thing you don't have to do a figure eight it's just a round turn around it's just a overhand knot it's a i think you can't not tie that knot you can go in either direction it doesn't matter it's it can't slip because it, all it is is it it's just a, a it's just a an overhand knot. now by doing that and then this next part oh and i forgot one thing that i said don't forget okay so now i have a stopper. So when I what I'm going to do is this one doesn't get floats. This one on the top has two floats. And another trick is you can always put all your floats. You, you can almost use the top as just flotation. Take all your floats and if you have no oysters in them, you could put them all in the bag. I wouldn't do that because uh, then you're wasting the space. But what you're going to do is then go through and what I didn't do and I said I was going to do it I was at Tiana and I had my rigging knife with a with, with the marlin marlin spike and I lost it but I have a uh, I'm going to go get a pencil as a fit hold on this is very primitive if I needed a fit, what works really well is a screwdriver. Here's a pen, okay? And this is a fine mesh cage, and it's hard to get the line through there. So if you took a screwdriver or a fit or something, or even a scissor and poked a couple meshes out, I'm just gonna run this pen. And I'm not gonna do this for the whole thing because I know I'm gonna break the pen. Uh, but you get the picture. I'm widening up that one mesh and then I'm going to just run the, I tried to make a, a little needle to put in and I, I had a pipette made out of plastic. Uh, the, the real trick would be not to use your fi this fine mesh cage or a thinner line or use a screwdriver and you don't want the Phillips end, you want a, a broad bladed screwdriver and just put it in. Now this goes right through. If I could see. It goes right through and then finish it off with another overhand knot and it can't slide. And then you do that on all four sides and you will get a bridle of two, of two cages hanging down. And they'll be floating because the top one has the floats, it's gonna keep it nice and level. The bottom one is gonna be in deeper water. I wouldn't do more than two levels. 
Don't do three, don't do four. Make two pair, if you have four cages, make two pair of two. Because they get, they get heavy after, when you go to fall them up in winter. So that's bridling with flotation on the top. And that will work very well. If you want to just put your flotation on the top and leave them out on your lines all in a straight line, that's perfect. That's fine. That's going to be just, just fine. Uh, if you want to dump your oysters out and put them into lantern nets, if you want to leave them in your bay boxes, you can leave them in your bay boxes because you don't want to change the flavor, that woody, oaky flavor that you're getting from your bay boxes. Okay. Uh, uh, Michael, you're going to have to run an experiment with a, a regular cage next to your bay boxes to see if you're imparting a, a nice oaky flavor into your oyster. These are the yeah. Yes? We need to do it, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing with this program is the only way that we learn really fascinating things is by experimenting. Some, some crackpot comes up with a crazy idea and, and it's like, well, look what I did. And it's like, wow, that's totally awesome. And Kim, what's the bay box? Uh, 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 well, I can go get one. <laughs> here, here's a, okay, so I'll be right back. Here, here, come, here comes the sales pay. No, go for it. Here comes the sales. You have one? Uh, there's one in my office. Uh, the, the, we can. The, the, the SPAT members that have uh, Michael got very bored one winter. And was and, and got thrown out of the kitchen because he was making a mess. So he had to go down to his workshop. That's what happens to me all the time. I get I get banished to the garage and uh, and and made these boxes for growing oysters. And uh, they're not only are they functional, but they're actually quite beautiful. Uh, and so you know there, there's 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 an aesthetic nature to it there's a handling nature to it there's a foul anti-fouling nature to it there's a stability nature to it and then there's the elusive oaky flavor that you can impart into your oyster now i don't know you have to start using oak french oak we're going to work on that okay, all right oh and here comes the dog has a Rock strap to it. Kim, a quick question. Um, Dan asked, is it better to put your floats on top closer to the edge or the center? Uh, closer to the closer to the edge. It, it doesn't really matter uh, because they're so buoyant. Those floats are really the other the other problem to tell you the truth that I have with having them on the sides ever is those cages practically levitate over the water. They're so buoyant. Uh, you know, in the winter, if they're on the sides, I really think that if ice comes along, that whole thing is just going to be locked in ice on the surface because they're so buoyant. So anywhere you put them along the top uh, is going to be fine. But I think if you keep them as much on the outboard as possible, if there's any, especially if you're not, if you're in a in a in a more turbulent area and you get a lot of rocking you'll you'll get better stability with them on the sides than in the center maybe not we we'll, could we'll, we'll fool with that where's that bay box you're sitting on it they're tough where is it michael's gonna make you a table for your house out of one of them no, look at that bay box <laughs> <laughs> okay so here am i in the camera yes yeah, beautiful and show them how the door opens. Okay, Michael, you're gonna have to hold it. Yeah. Okay. Right? Tighten up to loosen. Ta da Easy access. Very no. nice. No zip ties. No zip ties. No plastic. No plastic. No plastic all organic. Friendly. And yeah. it's great. It's it's very simple. Not complicated. You don't get all mucked up and dirty. So I'm enjoying that part of it. Yeah. Well, and, and now my idea, my marketing idea was to sell each one of them with a little tiny plastic lobster inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I remember you first told us that if it doesn't work out, we could always put glass on the top and sell them as coffee tables. Coffee tables. Yeah. 
No, so I'll see. <laughs> so, uh, yes. So that's an option later on. If people are interested in the Bay Box, you can reach out to us and we'll get you uh, dialed into, into the Shermeyer residence and, and, uh, and off you go. Now, uh, in the meantime, we've talked about the cages with the floats on top. The, the bottom line is that pretty much most spat people are growing in the cages with floats. And so again, putting the floats on the top, you're gonna be done, okay? If you want to, there's two things you can do with these lantern nets. If you're at Tiana and you're used to overwintering them in here, they are available, you can go ahead and do that. The things that you're going to do when you do that uh, is, and we can supply it. I'm, I, I'm trying to avoid, uh, again, all this plastic and stuff, but if we had a, you know, some flotation, piece of flotation in the top tier, and you can put oysters in the top tier as well with the flotation. But here's a little note to folks that are putting their oysters in lantern nets for winterizing. There's two things I want to say. First is the lunchbox. Sorry, Darcy, I never sent a picture of the lunchbox, but here's the lunchbox. If you are growing oysters and you've got beautiful oysters and you want to eat them for whatever December holiday you celebrate or New Year's or Valentine's Day or any of these days that you want to eat them in the winter and you've overwinterized your oysters, pull out the biggest ones, put them in a lantern net, uh, and, and we'll set it up as a lunchbox so that you can get them uh, whenever you want them. There's some caveats to that. You must label well, and we're going to talk about labeling for the 64,000th time in a minute. But there's another note. If you're going to put heavy oysters in something that's going, don't assume that you're going to be at a, a dock or, or hanging from a, a dock. You might be on a buoy line. If you're on a buoy line and you have flotation, I mean, if you're on a dock, you don't need flotation because you're tying it off to the dock. But if you're hanging it from a buoy line and your oysters weigh 600 pounds and you put a swim noodle in the top, I can guarantee you that that thing will not float, okay? So I, I, you know, I, it, should, it, it should be blatantly obvious, but let me tell you something. In my experience, it clearly isn't blatantly obvious because I'll get these nets that weigh a half a gorilla and there's a swim noodle in the top and I put it on the buoy line and it sinks the buoy line. So, you know, it happens to me all the time. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's not a problem because I add, uh, yeah, it's, the problem is that then people zip tie. If you're going to zip tie these, here's a couple other things. These things have little metal clips on them that fold over and you need a cast iron thumb. And if you don't have a cast iron thumb, that's a cast iron thumb. See how gnarly that thumb is? That's from doing this all the time pressing these brass clips down. I just got one. Okay, I was gonna steal Kimmy's thimbles, but apparently she has no thimbles that fits this cast iron thumb, okay? So people have a kind of a hard time pushing these down so they'll zip tie them, that's fine. But if you put 20 zip ties on this thing, it's like, it takes a long time to open it up to throw an extra piece of foam in there. What I would do with these, because the clips are actually quite nice, you can use a tool, by the way, to push them down. But right here on the corners, they're a little gappy. That's where I would add a zip tie. So I take a little, I have a little one here somewhere. Hold on. I have a little one. Well, I got a medium one. I'm going to waste a medium one. We have the little, we have all sizes of zip ties at, at, at Cornell. We have 14 inch for the floats. We have eight inch for making the cages. We have four inch for closing them. So the four inch, you can take a cable tie, go right in the corner here. I don't have to close it. Put it in the corner here. And that's a nice safety. One on one side, one on the other side. 
And even if these clips come undone, it, it, it'll still keep this door closed, okay? Lunchbox. Now, if you wanna retrieve your oysters from your lunchbox, obviously, I just invested, I put another uh, $150,000 of investment into orange cake and big chisel Sharpie markers. My two investments, I'm going to make one day. I'm going to, that, that's what, because I, I invested for the first time in my life and it's losing money like no tomorrow. Why? Because it's invested in like Tesla or something, you know. This is where the money's at. Orange marker tape and chisel Sharpies and bay boxes. That's where the money's at. Now, uh, I have a guy at Tiana who's convincing me that his tags do not last two weeks. Now, I don't know what he's doing to his tags, but if I mark this with my name, and by the way, I could tell you, I could go on for hours about marking tape. When you're going to make a marking tape, you don't need a banner, you need a little piece. But if you take a little piece, don't write a cryptic code like RF, write your name. Because if I find the thing, RF means very little to me, but Ralph Frydenhall Falfer, even though it just barely fit on the tape, then I know exactly whose it is. And the writing will stay all winter long. The other thing is, and believe me, I'm only saying this from experience. When I get, I, I, here I am, I'm saying, please label your stuff well. And then I see a lantern there, and it's got one of these orange tags in every tier, <laughs> sometimes two of them. No, one in the top tier will never go away. You can also have your, these are really handy. Oh. Now, I can show you this one if she's watching. It says Dizzy Lizzy. I didn't name her Dizzy Lizzy. She calls herself Dizzy Lizzy. I would never do that to anybody, okay? Uh, if, you, if you have a tag, I haven't, hey, Dizzy Lizzy, I have your tag here. I don't know why I have your tag in my, in my kit. We have plenty of tags. We can burn your name in. Uh, one of the Tiana guys embossed the whole string of lines. I've got all new tags for everyone at Tiana with their line number and their embossed name. And I've been putting them on the overwinter oysters at the Marine Center. So our, uh, the blue tag uh, with, the, with the name written in Sharpie, but I burn it in or I, I at, uh, if anyone like Michael wants to come up with a better way of embossing tags, uh, I tried Dremels, I tried all kinds of things, but so we're gonna tag them. I can't stress enough the silly orange tape because every year people are looking for their oysters and at Tiana, sometimes they go on the beach and if there's no marker on there, the trouble is if you marked your line and it comes off of the line and that was the only marker, well, it was on that line and I've got a marker on my line. Yeah, but the cage isn't on the line anymore. It's on the beach. I look inside there and I only am looking for one thing. I'm looking for the little flash of orange. And I was like, yes, it's got a tag in it. And I pull the tag out. I feel like a kid at a party with a grab bag. You know, it's like, oh yes, it's 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 Joey Freudenthofer again. How come his stuff keeps coming off the line? But at least he's got a tag. Okay. So, you know, you'll never lose your oysters. I found Andrew's oysters, it had its tag, it was embossed. The oysters didn't look so great, but the tag was fabulous. So he deserves a whole fresh new batch of oysters just because he tagged his old one so well. That's how I feel. Anyone that goes through that part is good in my book. Okay, so uh, we've got the lanternets, plenty of lanternets available for folks if they want to use them. 
black cages. You've got your floats. So we're, we're in good shape there. We've talked about labeling. Uh, I could talk for hours about knot tying and I'm not going to. So we'll just stick with the, if you can't tie a knot, tie a lot uh, routine. Uh, if you want to learn how to tie knots, uh, one day I'll have a session. It'll take like months because I don't know if anyone's ever looked at Ashley's book of knots or any of those things. It's virtually impossible to learn how to tie a knot unless you just keep tying knots that, that with somebody that can tie a knot and, and, uh, Kim, I have a question. Yeah. Hey there. How are you? Hi. Good. Are we attaching the top cage with pins to oh, the pulley thank, line? Oh, thank you, Mary. I'm going to talk to you. Let me get my kid out here and find a pin. Unfortunately, all pins are not created equal. Okay. We have a retired orthodontist making, now here's a nice pin. This is one of the new pins. This pin is, uh, I can't remember what gauge, 0.80 spring steel, stainless spring steel. This is a nice pin. I could trust doing certain things with these pins, but people are relying, let me see if I can find it. There's another pin, uh, I think there's one. Ah, no, that's a good pin. There are some pins that are so flimsy and people are relying on the pins and they're not holding. I, the thing with, the thing with even this cheap pop work is you're never gonna break that. Unless you're, unless you're, you know, growing your stuff on the open bay you got a dock, but it looks like the North Sea. I got pictures of Tyana that look like the North Sea, completely destroyed a floating upweller. So there are certain places that get really rough. And this might not break, but it might chafe and then snap. But I would trust rope way before I'd ever, tr never trust zip tie. Don't rely on a zip tie to hold anything, okay? Uh, when I tie off stuff on the, on the lines for Tiana, it's always rope and a safety hitch of rope. I don't trust the pins. Now, that isn't to say that you can't use the pins because I've put stuff out on a spot we have called Goose Creek where this pin right here can hold up 300 pounds of cage and is as we speak. But you have to, you have to know your pin. You have to, you have to look at your pin, kind of like you were pinning a diaper on your baby. Do you trust that pin to hold what's about to happen with that baby and that diaper? I mean, you know, there's a lot of risk involved there. And it's the same risk you're going to have with your oysters, darn it. So good question. And one of the reasons why, by the way, Mary, that a lot of stuff went to shore at Tiana. And I look at the pins failed. They, people were using the pins to attach them to the lines and the pins weren't holding. And they thought, well, I was pinning them, it's metal. Yeah, but they're not all created equal. So I would say, if you're gonna use pins, come to the person that knows pins. And I will give you awesome pins. And if I don't like you, I'll give you the other pins, <laughs> right? But I like everybody. What's not to like about you all? Pins, good question. But here's another trick for you with pins, okay? Because I'm not trying to dissuade you from using the pin. Let's say you're gonna take a cage or a, a, a bridle, your bridle or your cage, and you've got a pin. If this is the line you were attaching the pin to, here's the, here's the line. Here's the pin, like that. That's a mistake. What I would do is, here's the line. I wish I had three arms. Here's the line. Here's the cage. Watch this. I take, let me see if I can get a good view of this. 
This always works better in a plastic wire. Here's the line that I'm going to attach this cage to. I take the, it's got a bridle. And let's say this is either the lanternet or your bridle of, 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 of bat, of cages, of these square cages. And here's the bridle. Because these bridles, these four ends, you're going you're gonna to tie them all together like this. Okay? I go, I take this and I go, let me take the pin off for a second. I take this and I go completely around the line like that. Now it's around the line. Then I take my pin and I connect it to the bridle. So what it just did was all the pressure of this cage is not on the pin, it's on the bridle. Got it? That's a cool trick. It's also a lot easier to get it off of the line because if you pinned it, if you pinned it directly to the line and it got heavy, all the weight is bearing down on, on where the pin connects. And sometimes it's really hard to get it off of there. Okay, but if you took a round turn around there and then pinned this right to the bridle, you've done a mechanical advantage uh, of taking the strain off. Now all the strain is taken on the, on the turn. Right? Little trick. That's a little trick. I do that to confuse everybody because you'll never remember them. So but if you need a hand with that, we're always there to, to help you. So we got, uh, let me turn on the light. It's getting dark. Did you know, watch this. This is my house, right? Where is it? See that ceiling lamp up there? That's 28 feet in the sky. When I moved in, that light didn't work because the people never could change the light bulb. Now, how long did they live in this house with the living room having no light? Because the only light was 28 feet up in the sky on that ceiling fan. I was painting the ceiling. It's like, I wonder if this light works. I changed the bulb, four bulbs and it worked just fine. <laughs> Sorry, I meandered. But why did I meander like, oh, because I turned the light on. Yeah, okay, I got it. Don't mind me, it must be Friday. Okay, we did the uh, lantern net, the lunchbox, labeling, flotation, uh, cages, floats on the top, a bridle. Uh, some people at their own docks might want, they, they say, well, I'm pulling my dock and I want to put everything on the bottom. Okay, well, if you're going to do that and you really want to do that, we can, we can give you a bottom pedestal to, to, to put your cages so that they're not sitting right on the bottom, but they're sitting on, a, on the pedestal. But I'm going to tell you something. I tell this to everybody that's got oysters at their own dock that is either new at this or have had issues in the past. You do have the option of winterizing them at the Marine Center. And I think if it's your first year and you're not sure, this is for people that are in potentially high energy situations. You're out on, almost nobody in the SPAC program grows anything on the sound. You can, nothing's going to, it's just, it's all going to disappear. It's, it's so rough there. But if you're in the open bay and you've got a dock and you're, and you, and you would know because there's times in your home ownership where you, you, you're always worrying about your dock and sometimes your dock gets destroyed. If your dock gets destroyed, there's a good chance your oysters are going to go with the dock, you know? So, uh, you can winter your oysters at the Marine Center if you want. If you want to, if, if you're gonna drop them down to the bottom, uh, come see me and I'll help you because there's, there's ways of doing it. Uh, and all of them are a little tricky because uh, 
when they're, it, it, it depends on where, where you are and what the bottom is and how deep it is and how rough it is and, and all these things. And I don't want anybody to lose their oysters. You put a lot of effort into keeping your oysters. And, and so you don't want to lose them just because you, you, you uh, were kind of in a hurry and you threw them overboard and now you can't find them. So if you're going, if, if you're having an issue with winterizing at your own dock, uh, just drop me an email or, or come on by and, and we'll discuss it. I have, you know, um, we call him Grandpa Dusty. I got him on my desktop. He looks like the ZZ Top guy, Grandpa Dusty. He's first year and he's in a, he, he's in a turbulent situation. So he's going to winterize at the Marine Center. He's come by next week. And, and that, that's wise because, you know, we don't, if, as long as he labels stuff and all he has to do is cut a little piece of that, his beard is, you know, down to the ground. So he just cut a little piece of beard off and put it in the, or one of those orange tags, either one. I'll recognize either one, you know. Yeah, no, all right. It's not even an orange beard, but it'll work. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a good option if you're, especially if you're new to it and, and you're going away or you're just not sure what you're going to do, just bring them to the Marine Center and we'll, we'll winterize and we'll pick them up in the spring. Um, we got that. that. That's pretty much, you know, you want to keep it. Oh, but now you're going to winterize your oysters and you might say, well, what do I need to do? Do I need to sort them? Do I need to this? If it's the last time you're going to look at them for a bunch of months, I would get a handle of a couple issues like put your big ones in the lunchbox so you can eat them. Don't hoard them because you might get mortality in the older oysters. You know, have fun with them. You can get more oysters in the spring, more seed. How you, if, if you never sorted your oysters and they're just all kinds of different sizes, uh, I don't know if that's the best way to do it. I, I'm neurotic about stocking everything. I've got small, medium, large, and that way I can stock them volumetrically instead of, you know, if this, if you have a hundred oysters and they're three liters or four liters or a bucket, so be it. If you had a bucket of mixed oysters, you might have twice as many oysters by number. So, you know, you can adjust the number of oysters because everyone asks me, how many oysters should I put in the thing? Well, what I basically do is I take all my stock, I divide it by how much gear I want to deal with. If I have four cages and I want to overwinter four cages, I take my oysters out, I size them, and I put them into four cages kind of volumetrically. That, that just, that's how it works for me. I did that, by the way, all day today with the floating upweller seed that we have left for the, because I'm going to overwinter one floating upweller for the winter so folks can have some overwinter seed next year. And I spent the entire day going through every oyster seed, getting it to size, and then dividing it back into barrels the same way. If I have 10 barrels and I have all these buckets, how many do I put in there? By, by volume, by size, by amount of gear. And that just is uh, a, a, a pretty rudimentary but effective way of getting your stuff together. I've seen folks, by the way, and I never say a word about it, but since you're here, I'll say something about it. <laughs> if you overwinter your oysters and you put 30 oysters total in one net and you have 16 nets, that didn't really make that much sense. And some people say, well, I got a bad back. Well, listen, I've had a bad back since the first time I brought a refrigerator up three flights of stairs when I was 20 years old. I know all about bad backs. I, I, I can tell you 16 ways that I make sure I always have a bad back, okay? And uh, so I hear your pain, I definitely do. And that's why I never say a word. I never say a word. Ira, I know you're not out there listening, but Ira is like, oh, well, I got 10 pages this year. Okay, thanks, Ira. Could you bring them for me to the Marine Center? Yes, Ira, okay. And why do I do it? 
he helps me all the time and he's got a bad back. So, you know, we, we take care of our, our, our kind. But truthfully, they're understocked. They don't need to be that loud. I mean, if you were to have four oysters in each tier, they're not going to grow any better than if you had 40, really. If you had 400 in each tier, then I would say, yeah, you're definitely stunting your oysters because there's way too many. Plus the thing now weighs a lot. So there's a kind of a, a common sense stocking that they're not too light, they're not too heavy. They're just right. It's the, it's the baby bear. It's the three little bear thing going all over the place. So, so if you need a hand with that, and we got gear, don't get me wrong. If you want to keep them really light and you want a ton of gear, you're welcome to do that. Just don't ask me to do it for you. Because <laughs> I'm going to stock it the way I would stock it, which is basically, I'm, I, I, I digress for a minute, but I'm going to say I'm a symmetry buff. So when I'm doing things, for instance, these lanternets, I love to have pairs because now all of a sudden they're saddlebags. Three, okay, well, it's a tripod. I can deal with a tripod. Four, that's two saddlebags. Eight, that's four saddlebags, Ira. Thanks a lot. Where'd the, what happened to the horse? Well, he passed out because he's got four saddlebags on him. So I'm a symmetry buff. I like having, you know, the beauty of symmetry for overwintering on a buoy line is you just throw it over the buoy line and it can't go anywhere. It, 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 it's hanging down off of the buoy line. It just can't go anywhere, even though I try a safety hitch for everybody. But uh, anyway, it's, it's not going to be that difficult. We just wanted folks to know, don't worry about the winter, okay? Including, and here is the serious disclaimer, including if you never get around to doing anything, okay? If you weren't around all last year and you left your oysters, I have to say, they pretty much all died because you can't do that. You can't just leave oysters untended for a year. They don't make it. They don't just grow into giant oysters. They, they, it's too much bio load. They go through all, I've been throwing lots of cages that I found from, and everyone gets a pass. Don't worry about it. We'll, 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 get, we'll take care of people in oysters, but, uh, the more you do put your effort into oysters, the better oysters you're going to have. Chris, you've got good oysters, right? Yeah, Chris is there like every other day and all we all day, all day long on all weekends. So, you know, of course he's got good oysters. If you real, real quick question, when yeah. do we have to get them out? When do we have to when does Tiana close down? Uh it's already closed. Is that Chris? Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hey. You know, you know how many times your oysters came ashore this year? I keep putting them back on the line. <laughs> it's okay. You're a great guy, though, so don't worry about it. You always tag your stuff impeccably, so it always goes back on your line. We're going to be, I'm going to say, you know, I'm there every Tuesday, and I've been packing people out. Okay, so I'm going to say that by the end of October, you should be packed out. Okay. Okay, because here's why. I don't take the lines off. You don't have to pack out, but they take the docks away. And once the docks leave, that's what that was my question. That yeah, was my question. They're gonna, they're gonna, the trouble with the town is, and I'll, I'll find out. Now, at this point, they're not going to do what they did to me one year, which was take the docks out when everything was still out there and they didn't tell me and everything was just on the shore. I couldn't believe it. This year, they would never do that. Uh, but I would like to have everybody pretty much out by the end of October. And I'll be there every Tuesday helping out. And any other time, if you can't make it, and if you can't do it, by the way, I do it for you. I, I mean, I, no, I, no, I, I, I can, I can do it. I can never come Tuesday. Okay. Well, if 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 you need a hand, give me a buzz because I can double up on some days too. Uh, I can do other days too. But don't ask me to do Sundays. Or, or no, 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 I got you. I, I can't, I got, I got, I got something else on Sundays okay. that I have. Okay, okay, good. No, but we'll take care of it. And, and the thing is, you know, I've been doing this long enough that I, I don't take it personally when people can't get to their stuff to overwinter. I just do it. 
And, and it's because I, I have the trailer there, the truck there, I load it up, I take it back. I've got my, my alphabetical organizational skills back. At, it's called avoiding chaos at all costs. And it's worth the extra labor for me to avoid the chaos and the heartbreak of losing, the heartbreak of psoriasis and oyster loss, you know? Yeah. So no Kim, worries, no worries. Kim, but Kim, <laughs> yeah, I've got a question about, well, we're talking about overwintering. When is a good time to bring them back to their normal configuration? March, well, April? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And, and the answer is, as soon as you can tolerate doing it. And I say that because, you know, if you can't tolerate doing it until July and August, you've got a very low tolerance rate for, for, for outdoor stuff. I would say that if you, here's a, here, here's, a, here's a great way of thinking about it, because this is a double whammy. If you come in mid-May or early June to get your seed and you do it then, you're going to be fine. If you do it earlier, your oysters are going to be happier. April, mid-April. And the reason is because, and this is why I never tell people, by the way, when you're overwintering your oysters, oh, they're going to hibernate, they're not going to grow. So throw them all in one thing. Big mistake, huge mistake. You don't want to load them up because you say, oh, well, they're not going to grow. I'll just, I'm just going to put them in one thing. And I'll be done. Because the good chance is you're not going to get to them to put them in the spring mode and they're going to have serious bioloading issues. So you're better off having them so when spring happens. And here's the thing. You know, we're oyster people. We're people. We don't like cold water per se. And so oysters like cold water and they're going to start feeding when we would never think of going swimming. Like March 15th, those things are going to, there's a good chance that there's going to be an algae there that they can eat and they're going to come alive. And it's like, well, I'm not going out March 15th. No, you're not probably. So you want it to be nice and clean and orderly. So when, when they start coming alive, they're not gonna be like, oh, spread, right? And they're gonna be fine. And then you come around and you give them their first cleaning in, you know, if it's May, it's okay. If it's August, you really missed it. You missed it and they're gonna die because of bio-loading issues, you know, they're gonna grow really well and then they're gonna be like, oh. So, yes. I don't know if that answers your question. There's no hard and fast rule, but one hard and fast rule is, I mean, it was a shame. I, I, I know most folks by name. And so when I look at an oyster and I know you haven't been around. So Suey, she hasn't been around. I took her oysters up yesterday. They've been there for 18 months and they're all dead. All of them, there were four. And it's sad because you know, at one point they were doing well, but they can't do, they can't tolerate that. And I'm not, and I can't do the other people's stuff. There's, there's 250 families still in the program. I'm not, I'm not around. And I'm not trying to say, oh, you failed. Well, no, everyone gets a pass. It was a weird couple of years. I mean, let's face it, it was a weird couple of years. Um, and some people just got tired of, you know, if you get tired of doing the program, by the way, let me know because we'll give the oysters away before they die. I mean, some people have done that, but a lot of people just stop coming and their oysters stop. And people, they come a lot, they say, well, there's a net out there that looks like Willie Nelson and, and, and kind of, you know, Bob Marley and they're all hanging out and it's, it, it's a mess. There's all these things, but, you know, like Medusa and, and, it, and you pull and it's like, you kind of know that that person has taken a break from their oyster thing for a while. And unfortunately, it's usually way too late because we don't like to move people's stuff. Then you come out and you say, it was there, it was on that line. It was, it had, a, I, there's stuff that there's a trees growing out of oyster cages. It's the wildest thing. 
It, I went by one yesterday. It's like, yep, there's that. Obviously, that's a water tolerant plant, but that's like an upland plant. It's growing out of that oyster cage. Uh, that one hasn't been tended in a while. So it's okay. Everyone gets a pass, you know. Uh, I wish I had an, uh, just an unquenchable amount of oysters to just give to everybody so they didn't have to grow them. But half the fun is trying to grow your own. So. Uh, early is better. And, and always, I, I can't say this enough, this will come later on, but I never tell people that seed is available early. But if you're coming around and you're coming to these, these get togethers and lectures, I always say, get your seed as early as you can get it because it's going to do a lot better. It just is. Then if you, I, I have people that got seed yesterday. It's October. I mean, what do you get it? What do you expect? I got somebody that got seed yesterday. I mean, why not just wait till the spring, get it in the spring? You'll get, you're going to get seed that's almost the same size and it'll go. Whoosh. So anyway, I don't, I don't think that people are doing it because they are desperate for oysters. They want to learn stuff. So I never turn anybody away. It's like, oh, okay, here's your oysters. Put them in overwinter mode because you're done for the season. That's it, you know? So early. We'll see you early, Chris. Yeah, good. Any, any other questions or comments or I'm sure I forgot stuff, but there is the checklist that you can look at. Um, you, we, you can always reach out to us. We're always around to, to answer or to help out. We are doing the Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, uh, <clears throat> except on holidays, by the way, when I get a sad email, oh, I just came from East Hampton and took two ferries and the place was locked. Yeah, because it was, it wasn't Columbus Day. It was Indigenous Peoples Day. And darn it, I celebrated that. I celebrate that. If it was Columbus Day, you would have seen me at the Marine Center working. Yeah, you don't, certain people, you just don't. Oh, and I'm half Italian, so I can say that. <laughs> oh, there goes Kimmy. My mom grew up in, in Worcester Square where they ripped down the statue of Columbus last year in, in, in Worcester Square. That They didn't need to do that. They didn't keep Columbus up. But they didn't rip down Sally's Pizza or, or, or yeah, that's where pizza was invented. Good. Any other questions about pizza or anything else? New Haven? I have I have one small story to share with everybody, Kim. After last time's uh, call, awesome. I I took a bunch of oysters that I'd had this yep. year's oysters. Yeah. And I had company coming for dinner, so we had some ribs on the Bradley smoker. So I took about a dozen oysters and I just put them straight into the smoker for an hour at two fifty. Unbelievably good. So awesome. if you want to smoke oysters, it is the most amazing thing to do. Oh, yeah, totally. And they didn't come out like just oyster jerky. They were just, they were, well, actually, it wasn't, they were still like proper, proper shellfish, just cooked well, shellfish, but smoky. It was but let me ask you another question because uh, those were this year's oysters, weren't they? Yeah. You guys did a, a, a remarkable job. I mean, those were eight month old oysters, right? I had had them since June 8th is my date. And they were, I was so shocked and I'm continuing to be so shocked at Tiana new, new folks oysters are just like perfect oysters. They're, they're what are selling in, in Manhattan for, you know, $3 a pop. And they're like eight months old from Spawn Day, not from when you got them, from Spawn Day, which is pretty pretty remarkable and good news well that's that's nice i'll i'll have to try the smoker one day i'm, I'm i turned into a big wait fan it's an of appliance brewing. it's an appliance, oh, it's appliance. yeah my Kimmy is, <laughs> Kimmy is reminding me that she's the appliance queen i could take you for the rest of this tour i could no. take you in the kitchen and go through all the appliances hey, hey if, you, if I, you need help designing a hillbilly smoker i'm your guy awesome i know how to build them well, let's get that going as part of our, well, it's Bay Boxes and, 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 and Hillbilly Smokers. And we're gonna, we're gonna corner the market on quality of life, I'm telling you. It's all great. Excellent. 
Well, any other questions or we can always, uh, you can reach out anytime. And, uh, and that sounds good. Yes? Great class. Thanks, Jim. Okay, Thank you, Jim. Good to see you. Thanks, Jim. Great Thank you. Everybody.